It's a privilege as ever to be stood in front of you and to welcome you. As I've said many times from this place, not merely to welcome you to a building, not merely to welcome those who have joined us in Zoom or or Facebook to, to wherever you're seated at the moment, but to welcome you into fellowship with the one who has called us, the one who has declared himself to be Emmanuel, God with us. So brothers and sisters, we just encourage you this morning to come and to share in that fellowship that he offers. As you see from the elements to my right, this is a time for communion. We'll be celebrating that later on in, in the service. So if you're at home and you need to get elements, a bread and wine to drink or a little bit of squash, hey, just encourage you to take a time in the service and get that I, later on at the, at the end of our service. There'll be an opportunity to share in that sacrament together. One or two little announcements to make before we begin. Uh, lots of you who have uh, sat down in the building will see little flyers that, that are around and about uh, for our Christmas program. Those of you joining online may have uh, been able to enjoy a little video. I'm not sure if that worked out or not. Uh, but our theme for this Christmas is the God who can't be locked down. The God who can't be locked down. And we'll be celebrating that in a number of ways. There's a video available online if you want to see that to explain. But most importantly, uh, to to let you know some dates for your diary. Uh, We will have an all-age carol service on the 13th. That's next Sunday, the 13th, in the afternoon, 4.30. Encourage as many of you who can to come along and join us here. We will have a... Carol Singers on the, on the platform is how we'll be doing that. And thereafter, on a, the Saturday the 19th, a, we're going to do an online Chris Tingle. So we're preparing little packs of resources and we'll be sharing those out with all of the families that we're in contact with. And we'll be encouraging them to join us electronically as we take them through that Chris Tingle. And that's on Saturday the, the 19th, also at 4.30. And the whole way through Advent, we will continue to meet here on Sunday mornings and delight in the salvation that our our God has given us. Just thinking of our little ones, two things to say. I received this just this morning. I don't know if you can make that out. But that's a Christmas card. It says Merry Christmas, which many Christmas cards do. But unlike most Christmas cards, this one comes from Peru. Much love from Dave, Michelle, Jonathan and Phoebe. Sorry? And Ruth. Oh, and Ruth. Thank you. Thank you. For a child has been born for us, the gift of a son for us. He'll take over the running of the world. His name will be Amazing Counselor, Strong God, Eternal Father, Prince of Wholeness. That's the message we received all the way from Peru. Uh, For those of us in the building this morning, I would encourage you to uh, remember our social distancing rules, so maintain spacing. Please keep a face covering on unless you're on the platform taking part. Uh, And in line with the guidance we have, the, the, the band will lead us in worship, but we're encouraged not to sing ourselves. Let's still our hearts a moment. Lord Jesus, you are amongst us and we worship you. That's why we assemble, not to bring any glory to ourselves, but to bring glory to you, Lord Jesus. Our time together is going to open with the lighting of our next Advent candle, and that's Peter and Inger and Nathan are going to do that for us. When the Baptist proclaimed, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And the people went out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. And John said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me, 
I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. So we light the second Anfang candle this morning to remind us to change our ways. Let's pray. Lord, even those of us who have been Christian for a long time, perhaps especially those of us who have been walking with you for a long time, need that reminder. Because sometimes our fire has grown dim. Deepen our walk with you and renew us by the power of your Spirit. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you for doing that for us. It's lovely to see you get or have opportunities to get involved like that. Just to pick up on that theme of who we are turning back to. I'll read you a few words from Scripture. This is John writing. I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. And when I turned, I saw seven lampstands of gold. Among the lamps was a figure like a man in a golden robe that came to his feet with a golden girdle around his breast. His hair was white as snow, white wool and his eyes flamed like fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in the furnace, and his voice like the sound of a mighty torrent. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. His face shone like sun in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet, as though I were dead. Lord Jesus, you do indeed call us to turn to you. And when John heard that voice, he turned to you. And yet, in the eye of his heart, he had a revelation that was so beyond his comprehension of the Lord Jesus, you, my dear Lord, stood in all your glory. So this morning, Lord Jesus, we do turn to you. We recognize that you came. We recognize that you are among us now. But we do not turn lightly, Lord. We turn, and with a glimpse of your awesome power, we fall on our faces and we worship you. Lord Jesus, we are not worthy to be in your presence, but by your grace you have called us. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you can. We thank, that you, we thank you that you have come into each of our lives individually. Lord, and we thank you that you will come and minister to us day after day after day through this lifetime and into eternity. We glorify your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Our reading this morning is taken from Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 5, from the New International Version. The birth of John the Baptist. 
In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah, his wife Elizabeth, also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty, he was serving as a priest before God. He was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zachariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zachariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go out before the, on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When this time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days he has shown his favour and taken away my disgrace among the people. And so we come to our next Advent carol, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. I love that this song was first written in the 12th century. Folks have been worshipping God for such a long time and celebrating Jesus is coming.
Good morning. It is so good to be standing here this morning. Between the, the lockdown restricting meetings with people, social, social distancing and all of that, and not being able to move into the months yet, it, it, I don't know about you, but to me it felt like I'd only half started um, here. And the induction service last week, wasn't it a moving occasion? It really helped me to anchor my roots here as a pastor. And now I'm standing here, and it is my privilege to open the very word of God with you. Before we do that, though, let's pray. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Lord God, thank you that you are holy and sovereign and still you come down to be among your people. Your right arm still reaches out to deliver. Your favor still rests on those who call on your name. And with Zachariah, we stand at your altar. 
By your spirit, meet us in your word. Give us ears to hear it, minds to understand it, souls to delight in it, and hearts to embed that word in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This uh, Advent and Christmas, under the banner, the God who cannot be looked down, we will be reminding ourselves that God isn't boxed in by our expectations. Reminding ourselves of the way that he can step into our lives and do the unexpected. So that's all that we can do when he does that. All that we can do is abandon all our plans and join in with whatever it is that he is doing. And that is what happened to old Zechariah and all the other actors in the Christmas drama that we will, we will be looking at um, in the weeks to come. And I absolutely believe that it is happening again today because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, isn't he? The big story of God and his people is still being told, and you and I, we are part of its unfolding. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah. When we read this, when the story starts, a, a chill should run down our spines. Quite simply, Herod was a monster. He came to power amid a bloodbath with the help of two Roman legions in 37 BC. He murdered both of his brothers-in-law and his beloved wife, Miriam, as well as her mother. And later, of course, he would try and see of Jesus by ordering every male baby and toddler in the country to be put to death. In other words, the story of the light of the world starts against a backdrop of utter darkness. And typically, it starts not with the great and the good, but with uh, an insignificant couple from minor priestly clans, Zechariah and Elizabeth, both elderly and well past their cell-by date. There's no cell-by date in the kingdom of God. You know that, right? And the day is going to be the highlight of Zechariah's priestly career as it is his turn to minister in the holy place just outside the Holy of Holies. And that is uh, something a priest like him will be chosen to do only once in his lifetime. Now, Michael Carr describes the scene like this. He writes, As Zechariah is inside the holy place serving God before the table of incense, the people are outside praying. That is what Zechariah is doing symbolically. The people are doing in reality. And inside the holy place is dark and full of smoke. And as Zechariah stands before the altar of incense, it must dawn on him that this is indeed the greatest day of his life. All at once, then, he becomes aware of another presence standing in the room on the right side of the altar of incense. That is, standing in the place of authority next to the place, the altar where God is present. And perhaps something inside Zechariah thinks, this is no man. Do not be afraid, the angel says. These are almost always the first words that come from the lips of angels. Have you noticed? Presumably, the sight of an angel is a fearful thing. Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. What prayer? There are two possibilities. First, the prayer Zechariah just prayed as did the people outside, is almost certainly a prayer for the coming of the promised king and the deliverance of uh, the nation of Israel and its people. Maybe that prayer. But of course, we know that deep inside Zechariah is another prayer, a lifelong prayer that by now he has given up on. The night spent weeping with his wife, begging God for a child 
to bless their marriage. Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. What prayer? Well, both of them. Because God cannot be locked down and he is good. The two will conceive a son whom they are to name John. And John will be the fulfillment of Malachi's prophecy, which reads, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you, that's in Malachi, before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents. So John is to be part of the answer to Zechariah's other prayer as well, because his son, John, his mission will be to prepare the people for the reign of King Jesus. And the interesting thing here is that Zechariah, for all of his priestly office and righteous life, isn't prepared at all for his prayers to be answered. He had read the prophet Malachi many times. Likewise, he surely must have read the story there in Genesis 17, where an, an angel very similar tells Abraham that he and Sarah and all, in their old age will have a son. And in fact, Gabriel, in this scene with Zechariah, uses virtually exactly the same words that the angel used with Abraham thousands of years before. And that takes us to our first point. Prepare. Prepare. Before God acts, he prepares his people. So pay attention. Look at the events around us with eyes of faith. God quite often sets out signposts that point us in the right direction. And when you see those signposts, prepare for the journey there. Following, and I apologize, some of us have heard that story, but many won't have. Following my curacy in the Church of England, I ended up working in software development for a while, a couple of years, not quite knowing whether or how God would ever lead me back into ministry. And it is about seven years ago that my wife Inga told me, she said one day, you know what, I've been praying, and I think God is going to lead us into a new season. I don't know how, I don't know what, but I think God's telling me that. She's always been much better at uh, paying attention to signposts than I am. You should see us drive around in a car. <laughs> um, and then... A few months later, my employer's project pipeline started drying up, and in the end, half the company got their redundancy notice in March 2015. I actually think that quite often happens when God wants to move people on. He gets them made redundant. So I thought, well, I don't think I'm, I'm meant to be applying for the next job I, I don't really want. So what I did is I suggested to my employer this little setup. I extend my notice period by three months, and then I commit to take those three extra months as unpaid leave. It's kind of a win-win proposal. I get three months to explore whatever God may be doing, and my employer, well, they could potentially keep me on should business over the course of half a year pick back up again. So the Wednesday before Easter, then, my proposal was accepted. And I was thinking and praying, okay, Lord, now I've got three months over the summer. How do I use that time well? Lord, what would you have me do? Two days later, Good Friday, I preached in church. And after the service, someone who knew absolutely nothing of what I just told you walked up to me and said out of the blue, Peter, I've got a bit of a strange question. There's this church in Spain that I'm looking for a pastor for over the summer. Would you be, by any chance be interested and able to do that? Well, my jaw dropped on the floor. 
Uh, I said Steve. Yes, that was the very same Steve Hall who preached at my induction last week. Now you know why I invited him. I said, Steve, you have no idea what you're asking, but I think the Lord has just answered a, answered a question for me through you. I've never been to Spain in my life. I know nothing about expats or tourists, but the answer obviously has got to be yes, I'm going. I know how to use my three months. So I spent the summer then at Javier International Baptist Church in Spain, and that started the journey that took me here to this place. Signposts. And it also takes us to the second point. Prepare. And then trust. Remind yourself who God is. Believe. Be willing to act on what you see and hear. Zechariah couldn't quite believe Gabriel. He asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. All the worship that he had participated in, all the signposts that he had seen, all the stories he had, he had read in the scriptures, the very presence of God's authority in the angel that are standing before him, it wasn't enough. At that point, belief deserted him. So the angel confirmed to him that the time of fulfillment of his prayers had come, but that he, Zechariah, would be silenced. It is impossible to spread the good news from a posture of unbelief. Impossible to call all us to trust when trust isn't anchored in your own heart. Well, Peter, you might say, I've just had an incredibly tough and painful year. I find it sometimes very hard to trust. And the answer would be yes. We all do. Of course we do. And the good news is this. The story of redemption does not depend on our faithfulness, but on God's faithfulness. Zechariah is now silenced, but the promise and the prayer will still be fulfilled. Despite Zechariah's unbelief, he will still have a son, John, and John will still prepare the people for the coming king. And I think that's an encouragement because it means that when our trust falters, and it does sometimes, it may change things, but God will still do the good that he intends to do because it depends on his faithfulness and not on ours. Are you with me? What would have happened, I sometimes wonder, if I hadn't carved out those three months simply on trust five and a half years ago? Would I still have been led to Spain? Would I still be here? You know what? I will never know. I'm just grateful that God gave me the courage to act like then. So after Zechariah's service is completed, he and Elizabeth return home. They conceive. The Lord has done this for me, Elizabeth said. These days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. In those days, you see, childlessness was seen as a disgrace, a sign of God's favor lacking on you, probably because there's some hidden sin somewhere. Elizabeth could so easily have been bitter about all those years of longing for a child, long years of being a disgrace to her people, not understanding what on earth God was doing and why. She could so easily have been bitter, but she isn't. Which takes us to our last point. Prepare, trust, praise. We do not always understand. Why redundancies? Why childlessness? Why COVID? Why Morris Markham and all the others? that we know and love. 
Why do we have to go through what we're going through? It can be so easy to become disillusioned and bitter when prayer after prayer doesn't seem to go answered. It would have been so easy for Elizabeth and Zechariah. In those times, we need to remember that God is still good, especially when the days are dark and the light is long in coming. God is still good, always good, and we can praise him for that. Then we praise him when he shows up. And we praise him when he does what we never expected him to do, as old Elizabeth does. In this reading, we meet the God who cannot be locked down. Not locked down by our expectations. Not locked down by our lack of trust. And not locked down by our circumstances. And you know what? That very same God is still alive today. And we are going to praise him right now. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are good, so good. You are the potter, we are the clay. Prepare us for whatever you are about to, or you are about to do next. Whatever that may be. We cannot see the future, Father, as we have all discovered afresh this year. But you can. Help us to see the signposts that you have set out for us. And help us to act on them. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the grace poured out over all of us when you came to live as one of us. In this Advent season, Lord. We are preparing to remember that once again. And as we do so, we pray, will you inspire in us a deeper trust? Wake up our souls. Make us realize that you are still alive and active today. That when we choose to walk with you, we never walk alone. Give us great courage and confidence to go wherever you lead, Lord. And Holy Spirit, will you give us a heart of worship? When life is tough, and it is tough right now, we choose to praise the God who is good and faithful, even when we are not and when the, when the world is a broken place. We praise the God who is drawing all to himself. We praise the God who will make all things new. We praise the God who will wipe every tear. We praise the God who cannot be locked down and who is with us here, now, today. God, like Elizabeth, we choose to praise you. Amen. Amen. We're now going to uh, share bread and wine. So. Jesus said, I am the bread that gives life. He who comes to me will never be hungry. Who He who believes in me will never be thirsty. And this meal that we share is nothing less than one of those signposts that God institutes for us to remind us of his great goodness, to equip and prepare us for service, to deepen our trust, and to inspire us to praise. So come. Come to this table. Jesus himself 
invites us. It's not Peter and Han. It's Jesus. Come whether you are young or old, happy or sad, weary or energetic, burdened or relieved, strong or weak. Come to simply ask, Lord, give us this bread. Pour out this wine. If you're in church, you should have received um, a cup and a piece of bread. If you're at home and uh, managed to get bread and wine or juice to hand, please join us here. But before we share the bread and the wine, God encourages us to keep short accounts with him, to confess Psalm 32, verse 2 says, Happy is the person whose sins are forgiven, whose wrongs are pardoned. So let's spend a moment. Was there anything wrong that you did or said recently, or maybe failed to act, failed to speak, when you realize now that perhaps you should have before God? Let's start by just telling our Heavenly Father, He loves us and will forgive us when we come back to Him in repentance. So let's do business with God in a few moments of silence. Psalm 32 says in verse 10, Wicked people have many troubles, but the Lord's love surrounds those who trust him. And now standing in that love, we remember how the night that he was betrayed, Jesus had this final meal with his friends. In the evening, Jesus was sitting at the table with his 12 followers. They were all eating. And while they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he thanked God for it. And then he broke it. And then he gave it to his followers and said, take this bread and eat it. This is my body. And then after Jesus took a cup, and he thanked God for it and gave it to the followers, and he said, every one of you, drink this. This is my blood, which begins the new agreement, the new covenant that God makes with his people. This blood is poured out for many to forgive their sins. I tell you this, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine again until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Spend a moment in thanksgiving before we share the elements. Loving God, we praise and thank you for your love shown to us in Jesus Christ, for his birth as one of us, for his life and ministry, for his healing of the sick and the lifting of the weak, for his sacrifice on the cross and your raising him to new life, a foretaste of the glory that we will share with him. Amen. So we eat this bread to remember Jesus' sacrifice on the cross.
We share this cup to remember Jesus' blood shed for our sins and transgressions. Lord, we thank you. We praise you for all that you have done for us. Pour your spirit out on us that we may love each other just as you have loved us. That we may work for the healing of creation, that big, big story of God that we are part of. And that we may share the good news of Jesus as we wait for his coming in glory. Amen. We are going, we are going to continue praying and Sally is going to help us with our intercessions. Okay, so I'd like to um, like for us to use a response this morning, taken from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus is with us always, to the very end of the age. And those are the words that he said to the disciples when he gave them their purpose to go and tell all the world about him. So after I've prayed, I'll ask you to respond. Jesus is with us always to the very end of the age. And that's Matthew 28, verse 20, if you want to have it to hand. So, uh, Lord, um, your word says the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. We pray for those who doubt this because of old voices of condemnation who've wearied our souls with their destructive words. We remember that your healing love through salvation in Jesus protects us against condemnation and revokes its power in our lives. We remind ourselves that only in Jesus do we become the righteousness of God and that because of him our prayers are powerful and effective. And so we respond, Jesus is with us always to the very end of the age. We pray for those in government who and leadership who have had the coronavirus this year and who continue to be wearied by its effects. We lift them to you, Heavenly Father, knowing that you will sustain those who ask you for help and those who don't. As your word says, the sun shines on the righteous and the unrighteous. We pray specifically for the Prime Minister, for Professor Chris Whitty, Professor Jonathan Van Tam, Matt Hancock, Michael Gove, Dominic Raab, Ben Wallace, Alistair Jack and Anne-Marie Trevelyan. We pray also for their immediate families that you will determine their steps as they are vulnerable simply because of their relationships. And so we respond, Jesus is with us always to the very end of the age. We pray for our Queen Elizabeth II, that she will continue to be lifted up by you and strengthened by her sure and steadfast faith in you. We pray for Prince Charles and Prince William as they continue to recover from the coronavirus. And we thank you for your protection over them and their immediate families. We pray for their marriages, for your life-giving love to sustain them during the difficult months ahead. We pray for those members of the royal family who will need to make a choice in the near future, that your grace, mercy and wisdom will sustain them. And so we respond, Jesus is with us always to the very end of the age. 
can't see anybody responding, so I hope you can hear me. Continuing to pray about choices. Lord, we bring choices before you. You give us wisdom when we ask for it. James 1 verse 5 tells us that if we lack wisdom, we should pray to God who will give it to us, because God gives generously and graciously to all. So we pray for ourselves and those we know as we consider choices. Choices about who we spend Christmas with. Choices about work, exams, university, food, bills, chat rooms, medical treatments, friendship groups, relationships. We bring to you those who do not have choices. That the tenderness, grace and generosity you show to us will spur us on to love and good deeds for others. And so we respond. Thank you, Jesus, that you are with us always to the very end of the age. Holy Spirit, in these precious times, we're so grateful for your comfort and peace. We pray for those in the fellowship of this church who've been bereaved or ill this year. We give to you our people, especially Jane, Jane, Molly, Betty, Ian, Ruth, Roy and Audrey, Lorna and Vivian, Alison and family, me and my family and anyone else that I don't know about. We love you because you first love us and are in awe of your love for us. And we're so grateful that you, Jesus, are with us always to the very end of the age. We pray for little stars, nursery children, families and staff, that they will all know the healing, sustaining power of your love with them today, tomorrow, and for the rest of the term and the holidays. That they will know Jesus, that you are with them to the very end of the age. And finally, we pray for our new pastor, Peter, for Inga, and for Nathan. We thank you that he and Inga and Nathan chose to say yes to the job, the move, the church, the new family, the life, the responsibility. Show us how to honour them and be committed to them in practical ways and in loyal prayer. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are with us always to the very end of the age. Amen. Thank you, Sally. We're going to sing one more time in that song is a reminder that Jesus is with us to the very end of the age, that God is still at work, that even when times are difficult, and especially when times are difficult, we need to remind ourselves of the goodness of God. His plans are still to prosper. He has not forgotten us, sovereign over us. There is strength within the sorrow, there is beauty in our tears. in our morning with a love that God's out of me You are working in our waiting sanctifying us when beyond our understanding 
you are faithful even when we are not even when we are unprepared for what you're doing even when we struggle to trust you are the faithful God and all of creation sings your praise you are indeed gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Father, we pray, will you take us on that journey that you invite us on? Help us to accept your grace, follow the Lord's voice, that we may witness to your love, which embraces ourselves, those we call friend, and those we call stranger. There is this world out there that is in need of you. 
Amen. And now the, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.